Peter, Tsar of Russia, was exploring the boat sheds when he discovered a type of boat he'd never seen before. He asked the boatwright who had built this remarkable craft. He was told it was an English boat. Its construction allowed it to sail into the wind as well as away from it. Peter was amazed. All his victories were to defy tradition, expectation, common sense, and sometimes even the laws of physics. The spirit of his reign was summed up with the words inscribed on his medals. Even the impossible is possible. Peter was 10 years old when he first came face to face with a violent mob. Rebels from the Streltsy Infantry Regiments dragged away his friends and relatives and butchered them like cattle. The trauma caused Peter to suffer from convulsions for the rest of his life. No one could have guessed that this terrified boy would one day sweep away the old Russia and build a new one in its place. Chapter 1 Peter I Alexeyevich. Peter was the youngest son of Tsar Alexei I and not expected to inherit the throne. Alexei died when Peter was just four and was succeeded by his eldest son, Fyodor III. But when Fyodor died just six years later, the nobles decided 10-year-old Peter would succeed him, bypassing the middle brother, 15-year-old Ivan, who was severely disabled. After a revolt by the Streltsy regiments, real power fell into the hands of their ambitious sister, Sophia, who ruled as Princess Regent. Peter and his mother, the Dowager Tsaritsa Natalia, were sent to live on the Priabrzhensky estate on the outskirts of Moscow. There, Peter formed all the boys his own age into a toy regiment for his elaborate war games. Young Tsar was obsessed with war, not just with armies, but navies too. He took his toy regiment to Lake Pleshievo, 80 miles north of Moscow, where they learned to build and sail boats and experiment with naval tactics. Tsar Peter was remarkable in many ways, but most obviously in physical stature. At six foot seven, or 204 centimeters, he towered nearly half a meter over most of his contemporaries. What's more, his gigantic body had unusual proportions. He had very long arms with massive hands, but small feet, narrow shoulders, and a small head. His face was handsome, but became contorted when he was worried or anxious, the legacy of his childhood traumas. All his life, Peter was filled with inexhaustible energy. He could barely stand still and was always looking for some exciting activity to throw himself into. Unlike his older brothers, he didn't get expert tutors. He didn't even finish his education and made spelling mistakes his entire life. When his mother, Tsaritsa Natalia, received her restless son's letters from Lake Pleshievo, they made her both laugh and cry. This is a letter for my dearest mother, Tsaritsa and Great Duchess Natalia Kirilovna, from her boy Petrushka, who is working constantly. Thanks to your prayers, we're all well. The lake is no longer covered with ice and all the boats are being repaired. We need rope, though. I beg you to send me 700 fathoms of rope. Then we'll be able to proceed. With that, I ask for your blessing. Peter was fascinated by everything to do with craftsmanship. By the age of 18, he knew smithing, carpentry, wood turning, and shoemaking. 
He'd studied military science, fortification and shipbuilding, and learned German by speaking to men from the foreign quarter. This was an area of Moscow set aside for foreigners, established in 1652 when Peter's father, Tsar Alexei, ordered all non-Orthodox Christians to move to a new settlement outside the city. The new foreign quarter was built just outside the walls along the Yauza River. It was self-governed and home to Europeans of all nationalities. Most were military men, doctors or craftsmen, all seeking professional opportunities in Russia. Foreign quarter was just a few miles from Peter's palace at Priobrazhenskia. Every day he saw the spires of its Lutheran churches and heard the sounds of bustling activity from within its walls. Unable to contain his curiosity any longer about how these Europeans lived, he decided to pay a visit. He would soon make himself at home. Swiss soldier, Franz Lefort, was an experienced officer, handsome, capable, and well-connected. He was also a society host of some note, and Tsar Peter became a regular guest at his house. Franz Lefort soon joined the Tsar's inner circle, becoming one of Peter's most trusted friends and advisors. He also introduced Peter to his servant, Alexander Menshikov destined to become another of the Tsar's closest confidants. And then there was Anna Mons, the daughter of a Dutch wine merchant, who soon became Peter's lover. Peter became a regular visitor to the foreign quarter, learning to speak German and Dutch, dancing with girls, drinking wine and smoking his pipe. Naturally, when his mother found out, she was horrified. In the hope of encouraging him to settle down, she decided Peter should get married. His bride was the 19-year-old Yevdokia Lupikina. She seemed an ideal match, tall, beautiful, sensible, and extremely pious. But just two months after the wedding, the new husband left for Lake Pleshevo. Meanwhile, unrest was brewing in Moscow. Princess Regent Sophia was refusing to relinquish power, and her agents were trying to incite Streltsy troops to murder Peter and his family at Priobrzhenskia. When loyal Streltsy officers arrived one hot August night to warn him of the plot against his life, Peter lost his nerve. He ran out into the courtyard wearing only his nightshirt, mounted a horse, and rode off into the forest on his own. The next morning it emerged he'd ridden to the monastery of Trinity St. Sergius. He sent word for his family, his court, and all loyal troops to join him there. Nobles and generals, sick of Sophia's rule, sided with Peter. Sophia was banished to a monastery, and Peter took power. His first challenge was war. Russia had recently agreed to join Poland and Austria as a member of the Holy League, an alliance of Christian states fighting the Muslim Ottoman Empire. Their ultimate goal was to capture the Ottoman capital, Constantinople. Sophia had waged two wars against the Ottomans' ally, the Crimean Khanate. In 1695, Peter decided to attack the Ottomans themselves, targeting the fortress of Azov, which blocked Russia's access from the Don River to the Sea of Azov. Peter would fulfill his obligation to the Holy League while winning a strategic port for Russia. For the first time, the Russian army moved not by land, but by river, traveling down the Volga and Don on specially constructed barges. Peter himself held the rank of senior artillery officer 
and was the army's chief gunner. At first, it all seemed just a grander version of his war games and mock battles, but not for long. Two attempts to storm the fortress were repulsed, and Peter was forced to order a retreat. All winter, new vessels were built and launched from Varanej in the Don's upper reaches. By spring of 1696, the first Russian fleet, consisting of two large warships, 23 ore-powered galleys, and one and a half thousand smaller vessels, sailed down the Don to Azov. The fortress was now besieged not just from land, but from sea as well. Within a month, this combined assault forced the Turks to surrender the fortress. The Russians also won their first naval victory, defeating an Ottoman fleet that attempted to break the siege. Peter returned to Moscow in triumph, but he needed allies to continue his war against the Ottoman Empire. He formed a grand embassy to travel to Europe, which he would accompany himself, traveling incognito under the name Peter Mikhailov. Peter appointed his head steward, Fyodor Ramadanovsky, to take over his duties in Moscow, conferring on him, jokingly, the title Prince Caesar. He was entrusted with the care of the Tsar's family, Tsaritsa Yevdokia, and their six-year-old son, Prince Alexei. Peter's actions were without precedent. The court was horrified, but no one dared to object. Many years later, the engineer Andrei Natov described the reaction in his memoirs. Who ever heard or read of a ruler who, having taken the throne, left behind his crown and scepter, entrusted rule to one of his nobles, and left to wander through strange lands? It was completely unheard of. But this is what happened in Russia. At last, the Tsar got to see the world that he had read and dreamed about since his youth. Europe fascinated Peter. Not so much the art or the music, which rather bored him, but everything to do with science, technology and industry. And he wanted to try everything with his own hands. In the Netherlands, Peter Mikhailov got a job as a carpenter in a shipyard to learn how the Dutch built their ships. In England, he also visited the docks to study shipbuilding. Foreigners didn't know what to make of him. This strange, gangly Russian who wanted to go everywhere, see everything, and try it for himself. He was curious about everything. How whales were hunted, how the sick were treated, how paper was made. Wherever he went, he tried to persuade specialists to move to Russia to share their expertise with his people. Some even agreed. But Peter's main goal, to find allies for his war against the Turks, failed. Europe's great powers were too busy preparing for their own war to settle the issue of Spanish succession. No one had time for an alliance with far-off Russia. But in Poland, Peter did manage to find an ally to fight Sweden, his northern rival. Augustus, king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and elector of Saxony, was said to be the strongest man in Europe. When the two rulers met, they agreed to dine together. One observer later recalled that when King Augustus saw that a silver dish on the table wasn't clean, he picked it up and rolled it into a tube with his bare hands. Tsar Peter, thinking the Polish king was trying to intimidate him, picked up another silver plate and did exactly the same. The two rulers began picking up and bending all the dishes within reach. As they sat down laughing, Tsar Peter joked, Brother Augustus, we bend silver fairly, but it will be much harder work to bend Swedish iron. Peter hoped that a victorious war against Sweden would allow Russia to reclaim former territories in the Baltic, 
particularly the eastern shore of the Gulf of Finland. This would give Russia access to the Baltic and a sea route to Europe. But Peter's festivities were interrupted by bad news from home. In the summer of 1698, the Streltsy troops, whose revolt had so scarred him as a child, rebelled once more. Rebel regiments were now marching on the capital. To Moscow, they declared, we'll destroy the foreign quarter and beat the foreigners who reject our orthodox faith. To Moscow, come hell or high water, for we have a higher purpose. We will keep the Tsar out of Moscow and kill him for his faith in these foreigners. Peter traveled 300 miles in four weeks to reach Moscow. But by the time he arrived, his deputy, Fyodor Ramadanovsky, had defeated the rebels and begun dealing with the ringleaders. 130 Streltsy were executed. 150 more flogged and exiled to Siberia. But it was not enough for Peter. He ordered new interrogations and more torture, some of which he attended personally. A public mass execution was arranged in Moscow. 800 Streltsy were beheaded in Red Square. Hundreds more were hanged from the walls of the Kremlin. Peter beheaded five rebels himself. Noblemen and foreign diplomats witnessed the bloodbath. Around 2,000 Streltsy were executed in total. 800 flogged and sent to Siberia. Streltsy was now a word that Peter equated only with anarchy and revolt. After the executions, he decided to make some changes, both in his own life and his kingdom. He forced his unloved wife, Yevdokia, to become a nun and entrusted the care of their eight-year-old son, Alexei, to his sister, Natalia. Peter began to live openly with his Dutch lover, Anna Mons. The conservative Russian nobility was shocked, but Peter didn't care. Then, Peter made it compulsory for all nobles and townsmen to shave their beards off and wear European-style clothes. The only people allowed to keep their beards were peasants, priests of the Orthodox Church, and those who paid a hefty beard tax. A beard permit costs 600 rubles a year for a nobleman, worth about $100,000 today, and 30 rubles for a servant, or $5,000 today. Peter also forced his court to adopt European customs. Wives and daughters had to wear European dresses. Everyone had to know how to dance and make polite conversation. Courtiers had to brush their teeth every morning, drink coffee, shun traditional Russian food like pickled cabbage, and eat more Dutch dishes. Peter reformed the calendar so that years were no longer counted from the date of creation, but from the birth of Christ like the rest of Europe. Overnight, the year 7208 became 1700. And New Year was moved from September the 1st to January the 1st. In honor of the occasion, the Tsar instructed his people to decorate fir trees, entertain their children, and go sledging. Adults, he instructed, were not to drink and fight. There were enough days of the year for that already. The first New Year festivities led to a huge fire that almost burned down Moscow. Peter was not concerned. He didn't care much for old Moscow. Besides, he was preoccupied with preparations for his war against Sweden. A secret alliance with the Polish King Augustus II and the King of Denmark and Norway, Frederick IV, had now been signed. Both kings looked on Tsar Peter as the junior partner. Their adversary was the 18-year-old King Karl XII of Sweden, a lover of hunting and parades who no one took seriously. In the spring of 1700, Augustus, 
ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, launched an offensive in the Baltic and laid siege to the Swedish-held city of Riga. But for the King of Denmark, the war quickly took a disastrous turn when the Swedish fleet appeared unexpectedly outside Copenhagen. Unable to defend his capital, the Danish king was forced to make peace with Sweden. Soon, Augustus was forced to withdraw from Riga, leaving Peter, with his ill-trained forces, to face the greatest army in Europe alone. Russian troops were besieging Narva on the Baltic coast, but they didn't have enough artillery to break down its walls. After two weeks, the main Swedish army began to close in. As it approached, Peter appointed the Duke de Croix as commander-in-chief and left for Novgorod. He was not there to see the outnumbered Swedish infantry attack through the blizzard and inflict a crushing defeat on the Russian army. He didn't see the surrender of his hired foreign officers or the moment his men cast their banners at the feet of the Swedish king. Peter had lost one army. Now, he had to forge a new one. His military reforms would create Russia's first regular army, a professional force made up of full-time conscript soldiers. Military service was required from all nobles, and peasants were expected to send one man from every 20 households who served for life. Troops were rigorously trained in drill, while Peter's toy regiment formed the basis for two new elite units, the Preobrazhensky Guards and Semenovsky Guards. Soldiers also received new weapons, rapiers and flintlock muskets instead of the old arquebuses. In 10 years, the Russian army was expanded to a strength of 200,000 men, supported by a force of 100,000 Cossack cavalry. Peter had created the largest and most modern army in Russian history. After the catastrophe at Narva, Peter needed to replenish the treasury quickly. He reduced the amount of silver in the coins, providing more cash in the short term, but devaluing the currency, driving prices up. He was pushing the country to the edge of another rebellion. He was making people dress up like heretics, forcing them to cut off their beards, and now forcing them to pay for his disastrous war. There were rumors that the Tsar who'd returned from abroad was a different man. The real Tsar, it was said, was in prison far across the sea. Others openly called him the Antichrist. Peter didn't care. Instead, he ordered church bells to be taken down and melted into cannon. Peter's draconian taxes were bleeding Russia dry and triggering riots and revolts across the land. But the money paid for two large warships, the beginning of the Russian Baltic fleet, and allowed him to open foundries in the Urals that were soon supplying the army and navy with modern cannon. The introduction of modern artillery, combined with the effect of reforms and spending increases, soon brought results. Russia could now wage war against Sweden as an equal. Victories followed, with the Russian army capturing the fortresses of Nöteberg, Nienschanz, Narva and Marienburg. On the eve of this last victory, the Tsar received bitter news. His mistress, Anna Mons, who'd lived with him like a wife for 10 years, had been cheating on him. The passion of their youth was long gone, but her betrayal was still painful to Peter. His loyal friend and associate, Prince Menshikov, helped the Tsar to overcome his heartbreak by finding him a new mistress. The beautiful and charming Marta Skavronskia, recently liberated by Russian forces from the fortress city of Marienburg. Marta turned out to be the woman that Peter needed in his life. 
two years later, he brought her to Preobrazhenskia as his bride, where she converted to orthodoxy and took the name Catherine Alexeyevna. This kind and gentle woman, who had once served as a housemaid and remained illiterate all her life, would bear Peter 11 children and in time be crowned Empress of Russia. For now, the Great Northern War ground on. On Hare Island, where the river Neva flows into the Gulf of Finland, the Russians began to build a fort with six bastions. Named the Peter and Paul Fortress, it guarded the first Russian port on the Baltic Sea. This was destined to be the site of a new Russian capital, St. Petersburg. In six months, the first foreign ship would arrive at the port. Three years later, the first warships would be launched from the city's Admiralty shipyard. Peter's dream of dominating the Baltic Sea was within reach. The construction of the Tsar's new capital was beset with difficulties and, needless to say, hugely expensive. First, the marshes had to be drained, then numerous dams and dikes put in place to protect the land from flooding. It took 20,000 logs to build just one dike. Today, it would take 20 freight trains to deliver this much timber. Each year, 40,000 laborers arrived to help build the new city. And for the first time, the Tsar authorized the use of thousands of prisoners as convict labor. They were formed into labor battalions, working for up to 15 hours a day and even around the clock during the white nights of summer. In 15 years, these brutal conditions would claim the lives of an estimated 100,000 workers. Europe paid little attention to Peter's victories. All they saw was a greedy Tsar of the Muscovites seizing a piece of boggy shoreline and hurriedly settling in there. They were much more interested in his enemy, Karl XII of Sweden, waging war in the heart of Europe against the Polish King Augustus. In 1706, Karl defeated Augustus, forced him to give up his throne, and then turned on Russia. The two armies met on June 27, 1709, four miles outside Poltava. Both monarchs led their armies in person. On the eve of battle, Karl addressed his troops. He promised them that the next day they'd eat at the table of the Tsar of Russia. He's prepared many dishes for us. Go where glory calls. Tsar Peter also spoke to his troops. Soldiers, a time has come that will decide the fate of our motherland. Do not think you are fighting for Peter. You are fighting for the state he is entrusted with for your families, your motherland, for our Orthodox Church. The Swedish army at Poltava had a strength of 8,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry, and just four cannon. The Russian army consisted of 25,000 infantry, 9,000 cavalry, and 73 cannon. The battle raged for 10 hours and ended in a brilliant victory for the Russian army. Russian losses were 1,300 men killed and 3,300 wounded. The Swedes suffered 8,000 casualties, almost twice as many as the Russians, while 4,000 were taken prisoner and 17,000 more lost during the retreat. The Battle of Poltava ended 100 years of Swedish military dominance in Europe, though Karl remained a threat as long as he still commanded a powerful navy. The rest of Europe, however, was forced to recognize that Russia, long regarded as wild and backward, was now a force to be reckoned with. Peter had turned his back on Moscow, its onion domes, winding streets and apple orchards. His favorite place in the whole world was now St. Petersburg. Peter described these boggy, windswept islands as paradise. 
He liked to oversee as much of the work as possible himself, including the construction of the Summer Palace, inspired by the stately homes and gardens he'd visited in Europe. Every day Peter spent here was a happy one, as he watched his new capital rise up around him. He ordered that every cart entering the city had to bring three large stones with it, weighing not less than five pounds. These were used to turn streets of mud into the city's first paved roads. Peter could already see the great palaces, wide boulevards, parks and promenades that would one day make this city the Venice of the North. But Peter's quest to modernize Russia was far from complete. Everything had to change. Finances, bureaucracy, laws. There was no master plan. It would be step by step, as dictated by necessity. And the most pressing need was for money. Peter's tax reform centered on the creation of a poll tax to be paid once a year by every male subject in the realm. Peasants had to pay 74 kopecks, about $100 today. While those living in towns had to pay nearly double, 1.2 rubles, about $200 today. Peasants in some parts of the country were now taxed for the first time, including inhabitants of the far north, Siberia, and the Volga region. State revenue tripled, providing Peter with the money necessary for further reforms. Peter saw his work as a sacred duty and himself as the motherland's faithful servant. He expected the same from all his subjects, regardless of rank, from the grandest noble to the humblest peasant. To ensure the smooth running of the state, he created the post of Fiscal, a secret informer who sniffed out corruption, which was then punished brutally to deter others. But bribe-taking and embezzlement remained endemic. For every 100 rubles collected in state taxation, scarcely 30 reached the state treasury. The greatest embezzler of all was the Tsar's close friend, Prince Menshikov, whose income almost equaled that of the state. Peter finally lost all patience, declaring that if someone stole even just enough money to buy himself a piece of rope, that rope would be used to hang them. Menshikov talked him down, warning that if he passed such a law, he'd soon have no subjects left. Peter was involved in drawing up statutes and charters for many new bodies, from the Academy of Sciences to the Admiralty, as well as issuing hundreds of decrees. The Tsar legislated on almost every aspect of Russian life, from the type of boot polish used to the width of cloth that was produced, the profits of merchants, the proper way to construct stoves, farming implements, the correct form of wedding, the treatment of the sick, what sort of coffin should be used to bury the dead, and how many times a week a sauna should be heated. And there were more. Each new law stipulated the punishment for breaking it, a fine for talking in church, the death penalty for treason. Peter, it was clear, his subjects were like children who couldn't be trusted to run their lives without his supervision. He didn't ask their opinion, of course, nor did he ask the opinion of his son, Alexei, whose life he also governed in every small detail. Tsarevich Alexei was the son of Peter's first wife, Yevdokia, who was banished to a convent when he was eight. He was raised instead by his aunt, Princess Natalia, Peter tried to involve Alexei in affairs of state and took him on campaign when he was just 12. The boy showed early promise with an aptitude for languages and mathematics. But Peter's bullying behavior caused Alexei to fear and eventually loathe his own father and secretly wish him dead. The Tsar's enemies persuaded Alexei to flee to Vienna he was signing his own death warrant. 
Russian agents soon found him and brought him back to face his father's judgment. The prince was terrified. Under torture, he named all those he knew to be enemies of the Tsar and renounced his right to inherit the throne. He had fled, it emerged, because he was convinced his father intended to have him killed. The prince was imprisoned in the Peter and Paul fortress. On June 25th, 1718, a court found Alexei guilty of treason and sentenced him to death. The next day, the prince was found dead in his cell. The official cause of death was an apoplectic fit. The real cause cannot be proved. What is known is that the prince was cruelly tortured for days during his interrogation. The day after his son's death, Peter celebrated the ninth anniversary of the Battle of Poltava. But those close to him could see his grief. I suffer for the entire motherland, he wrote. My enemies play vile tricks against me. It's hard for people to believe in my innocence as they know none of the facts. But God sees the truth. Peter could see with brutal clarity how precarious his achievements were. If he died, everything would collapse. And the Tsar was not a well man. The opinion of Peter's doctor, Laurentius Blumentrost, was that his 44-year-old patient suffered from chronic bronchitis, inflammation of the bowels, chronic kidney disease, kidney stones, swollen liver, and damaged nerves. Peter wasn't good at following diets or cutting down on alcohol. Instead, he went to spas to take the local mineral water. Peter was now spurred on by a sense of his own mortality. First, he needed to end the Great Northern War, now in its 20th year. Even after Karl XII fell in battle, Sweden would not make peace and refused to recognize Peter's Baltic conquests. Russia would first have to defeat Sweden's navy. In 1714, at Gangut, the Russian galleys won their first victory over the Swedes. Six years later, at Grengum, they captured four Swedish frigates. Sweden then signed an alliance with Britain, and a joint Anglo-Swedish squadron approached Russia's Baltic fleet base at Reval, but was then forced to withdraw. In 1721, the war ended with the Treaty of Nystad. Sweden recognized Russian ownership of Ingria, which became the province of St. Petersburg, Livonia, modern Latvia and southern Estonia, Estland, now northern Estonia, and part of Karelia. Russia had its Baltic Sea outlet, and with it, the status of a European power. The Russian Senate asked Peter to accept the title Father of the Nation, Peter the Great, Emperor of all Russia. The moment marked the end of the Russian Tsardom and the birth of the Russian Empire. But what future for the House of Romanov? Few of Peter's children had survived infancy. His heir, Peter, died at the age of three. He had two adult daughters, Anna and Elizabeth, and a grandson, little Peter, the son of the late Tsarevich, Alexei. But Peter didn't want the boy to succeed him yet, fearing he would become the puppet of his enemies, who would try to undo all his reforms. Peter decided to change the ancient customs of succession, he issued a decree allowing a ruler to choose their successor. Let the ruler be always free, it said, to choose to whom they will give their inheritance. In the spring of 1724, at the Cathedral of the Assumption in the Kremlin, Peter solemnly crowned his wife, Catherine, as empress. Did it mean he intended to leave the throne to her? Tsar made no mention of the matter. Soon after the coronation, Peter learned that Catherine had been unfaithful to him 
and that her lover was the brother of his former Dutch mistress, Anna Mons. It was a heavy blow. Catherine was Peter's greatest love and closest companion. She was the only one able to calm his outbursts of rage. The German diplomat, Count Henning Friedrich Basevich, witnessed such a scene more than once. He used to have fits, caused by a dark thought entering his head that someone was trying to kill him. These episodes were a nightmare for those closest to him. They knew a fit was coming when his mouth started to shake. They would immediately send for the Empress. She would start talking to him, and the sound of her voice calmed him down. She used to make him sit down and would then take his head in her hands, brushing it gently. It was like magic. He'd fall asleep in a matter of minutes. So as not to disturb him, she'd hold his head against her chest and sit without moving for two or three hours. After that, he'd wake up, fresh and invigorated. Peter had never been a faithful husband. On campaign, he would bed the servants and the soldiers' wives, and even established a set fee for their services, one ducat per night. Nor did the ladies of court escape the Tsar's attention. In his father's day, women were kept out of sight. Now, instead of being treated like slaves, it was said, they were worshipped like goddesses. The many sudden changes to Russian customs social norms and dress were soon being blamed for a collapse in morality. The Tsar himself set a terrible example. His lovers included Mary Hamilton, a lady-in-waiting, Countess Avdotya Chernyshova, Countess Maria Rumyantseva, the Romanian Countess Maria Kantemir, and Elisaveta Sinyavskia all of whom slept with Peter with the full knowledge of their fathers or husbands. Catherine had tolerated all of the Tsar's affairs and never reproached him for them, but that was expected. Peter had Catherine's lover arrested and charged with accepting bribes to avoid public disgrace. The investigation was swift. He was found guilty in five days and dead in eight. Peter had his severed head preserved in alcohol and placed in a jar. Then, it was rumored, he delivered this gruesome gift to Catherine's chambers in person. Emperor and Empress did not speak for nearly a year. They neither dined nor slept together. But in the autumn of 1724, Peter's health suddenly got worse. He'd continued to ignore his doctor's advice. Now he would pay the price. On January the 16th, Peter was too ill to leave his bed. He called for the Empress. They talked for three hours. All that time, Catherine knelt beside him. At last, they made peace and forgave each other. The next day, Peter was in excruciating pain, but the doctors could provide no relief. His screams echoed through the palace. Catherine did not leave his bedside. On January 22nd, in between fits, Peter confessed his sins. Five days later, he asked for a desk to write his will. He didn't know that in the next room, generals and senators were discussing the succession. For many of them, it was a matter of life and death. One half, Dukes Dalgaruki, Galitsin and Repnin were for the 10-year-old Peter, the late Prince Alexei's son. The other half knew men like Menshikov and Tolstoy, who'd led the investigation against Prince Alexei, feared his son would seek to avenge his father. They wanted the Empress to take the throne. Peter wrote just two words, give everything, and fainted. At 4 a.m., the Senate decided the throne must go to Catherine. She was still at the Tsar's bedside, a 
At 10 past five, he died in her arms. The low-born Tsaritsa to succeed her husband caused a stir, but nothing to do with Peter's reign could shock the Russians anymore. She would be Russia's second female ruler in 30 years. And there was great sympathy for Catherine. Her life was a fairy tale, a housemaid who'd captured the heart of a Tsar, become his queen and empress. Chapter 2, Catherine I, Alexeyevna. The Empress knew nothing about ruling a state. She couldn't even read and write. The only thing she ever mastered was how to sign her own name. But that was enough to authorize the founding of a Russian Academy of Sciences, as Peter had always dreamed, and to authorize Vitus Bering's expedition to the Far East. On the whole, Catherine left the governing to others and devoted herself to parties and drinking. She drank ferociously, took many lovers, and danced till dawn. A typical day for the Empress began when she rose from bed at four o'clock in the afternoon. She dined at eight then took a walk in the summer garden. She usually went to bed around 10 o'clock the next morning. Her court was dominated by the serene Count Alexander Danilovich Menchikov. It was he who had first introduced Catherine to Peter. Then he had put her on the throne. Now he held the reins of power. He ruled through a new body, the Supreme Privy Council. Formerly, its role was to advise the Empress. But in reality, it ran the country. Catherine didn't attend the council meetings. She had no interest. She listened to its reports, but for no more than half an hour. Any longer gave her a headache. The Empress's dissolute lifestyle soon led to serious health problems. She put on weight and suffered from kidney disease and a heightened pulse. It was plain to see that Catherine would not live much longer. So Menchikov began to plan for the future, persuading the Empress to sign a will by which Prince Peter would inherit the throne, but only after he married Menchikov's daughter. On May the 6th, 1727, Catherine I died. She would be remembered as a kind and merry Tsaritsa and a loyal companion of Peter the Great. Many had believed that without Peter the Great's iron will, Russia would revert to being a second-rate power on the margins of Europe. But Peter's reforms had created an unstoppable momentum of their own. In St. Petersburg, Palaces were rising along the shores of the Baltic. Gardens were planted and wide boulevards paved. They were the first in Russia to be lit by oil lamps. Cannon-armed Russian warships stood out at sea, while Russia got its first printed newspaper, Vea de Masti, with a circulation of between 200 and 4,000. Merchants' goods traveled from St. Petersburg to Moscow along newly dug canals. Advanced schools of artillery, medicine and navigation were opened and the Academy of Sciences established. In the Urals, nine foundries produced seven million pounds of cast iron a year and 200,000 pounds of copper. They supplied Russia's new armaments industry, 
turning out muskets and cannon for what was now one of the largest, most powerful armies in Europe. Peter had dragged Russia from the Middle Ages into the modern world. But his new state would now have to prove its resilience and weather the storm of dynastic crisis and intrigue. It would be 40 years before there was another Russian ruler to match Peter the Great.